That's my cue to start. Good evening, everybody. Hey, welcome to the virtual night sky, uh, our version of virtual night sky uh, for October the 19th, 2022. I can't believe this, this semester seems to be just whizzing by. Um, we're about halfway through and it seems like we just started yesterday. So things have been pretty busy around uh, ASU and the campus and our building. And we're going to tell you about some of those things tonight. So uh, uh, before I get started, let me just formally introduce myself and some of my team. So my name is Rick Allen and I am a manager of community outreach for the School of Earth and Space Exploration. And um, we headquarter uh, on the ASU campus, uh, the main campus in Tempe, Arizona. And we've been doing this particular program, this virtual night sky, as a product of the School of Earth and Space Exploration for uh, almost two and a half years now, I think. We're getting close to two and a half years. It started out as a COVID project and then we just kept going. So every other Wednesday night, we'll be back with you. We've got programming planned into mid-December, and then we'll take a break. But I'm glad you're here tonight. As you know, if you're a follower, if you've watched this before, uh, uh, there's some things I'd like to just talk about. Uh, we, we do have closed captioning. We put that on the screen, but you're kind of in charge of it yourself. If you don't want it there, uh, you can just push that little X button and close it out. It won't stop anything else you, that you have. We'd like to use that because these programs are recorded, and then they become available on our website, so people can go visit them later. That makes it easier to deal with those translations. Uh, we encourage you, we absolutely want you to uh, do questions, ask us questions during the show. And you do that by pushing the little question and answer button at the bottom of your screen. You just turn that on, a little window will come up and you can just sort of ask away. If you have a comment or a question that you think we, you'd like to sh share with us, uh, sometimes those are answered in the background just as we're going along, if they're easy questions. And sometimes we take those audience questions and bring them forward uh, when we do breaks in the program. And we'll have two such breaks uh, this time uh, tonight. So, uh, so think about those. Think as we're going through. If you have any questions, want to do that uh, because we've got an interesting program tonight, and we'd like to sort of talk to you about some things in depth that you might like to know about. Uh, we uh, sort of uh, I'm just uh, uh, introducing the rest of the team. Kim Baptista, you might know the name because she's the one that handles all of the uh, registrations and she gets the communication out. And she's been doing this really, really a remarkable job for this program for for the entire time. So we love having Kim on board. Meg Hufford is a colleague of mine and she's uh, in there also work in the trenches. Uh, she and I are also outreach coordinators on campus. And so if you've visited our school lately, and many of you have because we've had some good programs, you have no doubt met myself and Meg on the campus there. Uh, we also have two students on board. Alex has been with us since the very beginning, Alex Blanche, and uh, Armandala has uh, become a fixture in, uh, in the, for the, about the last six months. Uh, what we're going to talk about tonight is we're actually going to kind of diverge uh, a little bit away from space and talk about Earth. Our school is actually an Earth and space school, and so we do the geosciences and, uh, and all things about geology and Earth sciences in our program. We also, um, of course, do astrophysics and planetary sciences. So you probably know us a lot about the night sky. That's really why we started. But we do want to kind of like tackle some geological things. And I'll tell you about that in a minute. I'm going to walk everybody through after a little geological talk. We're gonna, I'm going to walk you through some of the constellations that are up in the southern part of the sky this time of year. And we call them, I call it the watery part of our world. Uh, the, all of these constellations sort of relate somehow to water or oceans or rivers and those kinds of things, fish and those kinds of things. And so we're going to talk about those tonight, just kind of get everybody up to speed on what that means. Um, we've got, I'm just going to notify everybody about looking at Saturn because Saturn is in the, in, is perfectly placed in the evening sky right now. And we'll tell you how to look for it and how to find it and how to see it. Uh, Armand is actually going to give us a little preview of the uh, uh, Orionid meteor shower, which is actually sort of happening tomorrow and the next day. So that's going to be kind of important. Meg is going to give us a little review of something or a, pre, uh, a, a little sort of a, a little slideshow about something we did last Saturday. It was our Earth and Space Exploration Day. And we had a lot of fun and we got a lot of pictures to show you sort of about what happened last Saturday. And, uh, and uh, then I think uh, with if I've forgotten anything, we'll get to it by the end of the program. And, but that's a full program. That's lots of pieces here. Uh, so before any further ado, uh, I'm going to bring to the screen uh, a colleague, a friend, a former boss, a professor uh, at uh, Arizona State University, Dr. Steve Simkin. Uh, Steve is a geology uh, professor 
Baker. I'll tell you, he'll tell you a little bit more about what that means and what his specialty is. And you might recognize him because he's been on the show before. Uh, Steve was with us uh, when we did sort of some geology about Phoenix, Arizona and our region. And we also did, uh, Steve was with us, we did a kind of a talk about the Grand Canyon and a very special project he worked on called the Walk of Time that was up at the Grand Canyon. So uh, why tonight? Because tomorrow, tomorrow, uh, on the 20th of October is a special day. We call it the National Shakeout, and it's an Earthquake Awareness Day. So we thought we are a school of earth sciences as well as space. And if we need to know something about earthquakes and we need to be a, a aware of something going on, it's time to bring Steve on and uh, have him explain that to us. So Steve, welcome to the welcome to the program. I'm really, really glad to have you back on. Thank you, Rick, and thanks for that introduction. Uh, hi, everybody. Good to see you all again. And uh, yes, I'm a professor of geology in the School of Earth and Space Exploration. And uh, my specialty, my focus, I should say, is in the Southwest. Most of my research interests are in Arizona Southwest. I take a particular interest in the geology that immediately surrounds us, and that includes the story of earthquakes. And you might say, well, you know, Arizona earthquakes, typically the news uh, you hear earthquakes in other places, California, maybe closer to Alaska, Hawaii, places like that. But the fact is that that Arizona has had earthquakes and Arizona will have earthquakes in the future. And that's what I'm going to talk about now. I'm going to go ahead and uh, bring my uh, bring my screen up. All right. Your background looks really great there, Steve. Thank you. That's Monument Valley. I took Monument that. It's Valley. actually it's cool. not necessarily the most earthquake prone place, but <laughs> all right. So here comes, although, you know, no place in Arizona is completely immune. So, whoops, that's the wrong Yeah, slide. there you go. That, there that's go. it. Okay. We've got her there now. There we go. So before we get started about earthquakes in Arizona, I want to talk a little bit about what an earthquake is. And an earthquake is just very simply an event that involves a release of energy. We call it seismic energy. It's actually mechanical energy that's stored within the rocks and released very suddenly in the form of waves that, that uh, vibrate through the earth. And as a result of those waves moving away from a break in a fault, a fault is just a, a essentially a, a fractured surface in the earth's crust along which there's movement, or it could be, for example, magma moving underneath a volcano or you know other stress changes. Earthquakes have been triggered by uh, uh, pumping of wells or draining of wells. It's been triggered by, by nuclear explosion. They've been triggered by all kinds of human caused events as well. And uh, the two videos you can see on either side show two types of faults. Uh, geologists distinguish faults by the geometry of them. And you can see that the strike slip fault on the left is essentially a vertical fault and the oblique fault on the right is a, a fault that, that dips into the earth at an angle. And an earthquake happens when there is movement along that fault. Typically, um, there's a lot of friction involved in, in, you know, in rock. And so uh, rock may be uh, storing up stress and then it gets to a point where the rock can no longer withstand the stress and it snaps and there's movement along the fault and that energy is released in, in the form of an earthquake. And one other thing that those illustrations I think make clear is that people talk about a fault line. And the fact is that if you're standing on the surface, really all you see of the fault may be a line you know, a, a running across the surface, which geologists call a trace. But, but the fault itself is actually you know, in three dimensions. It actually extends into, into the earth. Um, it's a planar feature that extends into the earth at some angle. So this is what an earthquake is. The question you might ask now is, how do we measure earthquakes? And you, you'll, you'll hear on the news, they'll talk about um, magnitude of a quake. Maybe once in a while, they'll talk about intensity. Um, you might hear the, the term Richter scale mentioned. I'll, I'll tell you right now that actually we don't use the Richter scale anymore. Um, we use something else called a moment magnitude scale. And the reason why is because when Richter invented the scale, it was actually intended to be only used in California and doesn't necessarily work in other places. So, so you'll hear magnitude and it's not totally different from Richter scale, but, but you know, just if you want to be uh, in the know, you don't use that term anymore because we don't. Um, but anyway, we measure earthquakes in two different ways. One is called magnitude and one is called intensity. And the, the magnitude, the scale that you usually hear reported in the news is that of magnitude. And magnitude is a measure of how much energy is released at an earthquake source. A very strong earthquake has a high magnitude. A weak earthquake has a lesser magnitude. And that's something that we can measure on seismographs, on devices that actually measure how much the, the earth moves. 
and that magnitude is constant anywhere. The, the, the amount of energy is released from the earthquake and we have ways of correcting for distance from the earthquake to, uh, to determine the, the magnitude. Um, intensity is another measure of earthquakes and in many ways that's the one that's more relevant to us because intensity measures what an earthquake actually does. It's the strength of shaking produced by the earthquake at a certain location. And it makes sense that, that a, an earthquake with a high magnitude has more energy and so you would expect that the intensity is going to be higher, but the fact is also that factors beyond the earthquake can actually determine what the intensity is going to be. For example, an earthquake in an area that has very solid bedrock typically has a lower intensity than an earthquake that happens in an area that's maybe built on loose soil or loose gravel. And so intensity is, is something that's more local and um, structures too. I mean, if we have a lot of structures in a place where an earthquake happens and there's damage to the structures that contributes to a higher intensity. And if you're still not sure about the difference, you can have a look at the video on the right, which is created by um, the wonderful organization IRIS, uh, the uh, Incorporated Research Institutes for Seismology, which is sort of the nation's leading seismological research group. Um, so it's going to come around again. If you think about a light bulb, okay, uh, the magnitude of an earthquake is like the wattage of a light bulb. So like, for example, a small earthquake might be like a 25 watt bulb. A bigger earthquake might be a 150 watt bulb. And no matter how far you are from the bulb, that wattage doesn't change. That's the amount of energy that the bulb is giving off. But intensity then is how much light actually hits you. And that's determined by how far away you are from the bulb and maybe whether you have something shading you or maybe you're looking down or something. And so intensity is essentially how much light you get. And, that, and that's more of a local thing that's determined by local factors. So we can talk both about magnitude and intensity, and I'll, I'll kind of mention both as we go along. So Arizona, does Arizona have earthquakes? The answer is a resounding yes. And earthquakes have actually occurred in Arizona throughout its geologic history. Uh, the picture on the left I took in a place called 60 Mile Canyon, which is down at the, the depths of Grand Canyon. And you're looking at an outcrop of sandstone that's 1.2 billion years old. That's really, really old rock, even by Arizona standards. And the, the height of that outcrop is about six feet, a little bit more than six feet. Notice how that rock has got all kinds of wavy and squiggly patterns in it. Geologists call those seismites. And that's exactly what it looks like. When that sand was deposited, it was still wet before it had been changed to rock by pressure and cemented together. It was subjected to one or more earthquakes. And the waves passing through vibrated the sand and caused it to to form those wavy shapes and actually to flow. You can see places, uh, for example, right here. Um, I don't know if you can see my little cursor there, but right here, the, the, the fluid, the, the sand is actually kind of pushing its way up from one bed to another because of the pressure on, uh, it's undergoing during that, that earthquake activity. So that's essentially a fossil earthquake you're looking at, a 1.2 billion year old fossil earthquake, which tells us that earthquakes have been going on here for a long time. On the right is a map that the Arizona Geological Survey produced that shows the locations and comparative magnitudes of historic earthquakes in Arizona. And 3.0 now, 3.0 is not a particularly large earthquake. It's, there's no question that while we have earthquakes, we don't typically have as many of the really powerful ones as you might get in a place like California. But we still have them and we still occasionally have some pretty good sized ones. Notice too, that on this map, some of the bigger earthquakes are actually just off the boundaries of the state in northern Mexico and in California. And I'll get back to them in a little while. So why do we have earthquakes? Well, my, my friend and colleague in, in the School of Earth and Space Exploration, um, Ramon Aerosmith, likes to say that, you know, the, the geology of Arizona, we're still moving. OK, our crust is moving and it's moving steadily. And when you have constant moving in the crust, you got to ex expect a little breakage now and then. And we know the crust is moving because of GPS, global positioning system. Everybody has one in their cell phone. You have one in your car. It's a, it's a really ubiquitous technology now. Um, and what it is essentially is it, it's a receiver that, that fixes on three or more satellites, which are essentially fixed in the sky. They orbit in a geosynchronous orbit, 20,200 kilometers above the surface, uh, which essentially means that they stay in place. So we can actually triangulate our position by measuring our distance is what the receiver does. It picks up the signal from three or more receivers and it can measure its, its location incredibly precisely. And 
our GPSs in our cars and phones are pretty good, but there are also receivers that you can purchase for research that are highly sensitive, that can, that can measure position to within, you know, millionths of a meter. And when we set those in the ground, we find that we can actually measure movements of the Earth's crust on the order of just a few millimeters per year. And that's a rate that's comparable to how long it takes the average person's fingernails to grow. So, you know, if you went and didn't cut your fingernails for a year and you saw how, how long they grew, that's about how far Arizona has moved in that same period of time. And so we have these GPS receivers deployed all over the Western United States, which is still considered to be quite geologically active, including this one here at Canyon de Chelly National Monument on the Navajo Nation. And when we plot the data from those GPS stations, we get something like this. So what you're looking at here is you're looking at a map of the Southwest and you're seeing a bunch of red arrows. And if you look carefully, you can see that each one of those arrows has a, has a, a, a arrow head at one end. And what it's doing is the, the direction in which that arrow is pointing, it's a vector actually, and the direction in which those vectors are pointing indicates the, the, the direction in which that particular GPS station is moving. Now in California, they've deployed a whole lot of them. That's where there's that big flurry of, of arrows there. And what you can see is that they're all pretty much pointed in the same direction, which is they're going to the Northwest. And the length of the arrow is a, is a measure of how rapidly the crust is moving. And, and so that, that indication that you can see about 25 millimeters, right? So that's about two and a half centimeters. So that's about an inch a year, right? And uh, so um, notice that Arizona, we have those stations deployed in Arizona, but relatively speaking, they're not moving quite as fast. So it's very clear that California is where there's a great deal of crustal movement. There's less crustal movement farther inland in the West, but the crustal movement is still there. And because the crustal movement is still going on, that's why we still have earthquakes. So yeah, Arizona is not now on the plate boundary, the boundary between two of the Earth's great plates, uh, in this case, the Pacific plate and the North American plate. That boundary is just to our west in California and Baja, California. And that, of course, is the very famous San Andreas Fault. That's a, that's a surface along which the two plates are sliding past each other. And that's where earthquakes occur most frequently, in the vicinity of that active fault zone. Um, so the only part of Arizona that's really close to that area is Yuma, down in the far southwest. Um, so we don't really, we're not really where the, the real action is, but we're not totally out of it. The map on the right is a map of what's called earthquake hazard. It's produced by the U.S. Geological Survey, and it shows the relative susceptibility of a place to earthquakes based on its geological conditions. And so you can see that the highest areas of earthquake hazard are places like, of course, California, where the San Andreas Fault runs. Um, Eastern California, on the other side of the Sierra, there's, a, uh, there's a, a fault zone up there too, which is actually becoming more and more active. Um, the Wasatch Fault System, which runs up through central Utah and then up into, uh, into the north of, of Montana and so on. And then the Pacific Northwest, where you have plates, one plate subducting under another, and you have a lot of earthquakes that way. Um, the east, uh, the, the mid-continent area around uh, New Madrid, Missouri, there were some very, in, very large earthquakes in the 19th century that kind of tilted the hazard level a little high in that area. Some people suggest that they probably won't get other earthquakes that, that large again. But if you look at Arizona, Arizona is sort of a moderate level of hazard. I mean, we're not totally out of it, but we're not nearly as hazardous as, say, California, except in our far southwestern corner where we're kind of close to the San Andreas Fault. So again, to sort of repeat that, most of the faults that are known to have been active in the last two million years, there, there are faults that are very old that haven't moved in, in millions and millions of years, and there are faults that we consider active because they have moved in historic times or they have moved within the last two million years or so. The map on the left, all those yellow lines indicate active faults. You can see again, a lot of them in California, a lot of them in Nevada, central Utah, and also New Mexico, the, the Rio Grande Valley, uh, through the middle of New Mexico, also called the Rio Grande Rift, is actually pretty seismically active, more so than even Arizona is. But then you can see, too, that we have some active faults mostly in our northwestern area and a little bit down to the southeast. And on the right is a map of, of earthquake epicenters uh, since 1900. Uh, I think that's up to about 10 years ago with magnitude greater than four. And you can see that the clustering of earthquakes uh, is pretty close to where the faults are. And so again, in Arizona, 
Uh, most of the earthquakes surround us, the areas that are most active, but we do have some earthquakes in uh, the Western Grand Canyon and Flagstaff area and uh, in the transition zone, which is the mountainous region that separates the low deserts of Southern Arizona from the high plateau of Northern Arizona. So what I'm gonna do now is talk about a few historic earthquakes that affected either Arizona or very close to it, just to give you a taste of what's happened and you know, we, we can't say is not going to happen again at a certain time. So I'm going to start with May 3rd, 1887, because it was a whopper. It was a magnitude 7.5 earthquake. It was just south of Arizona. It was centered down here in the San Bernardino Valley, just west of the Sierra Madre. And uh, it was, again, a magnitude 7.5. And at that time in 1887, of course, the area was fairly sparsely populated. So other than the town of Bavispe, which was right on the uh, pretty much on the epicenter, uh, there wasn't a whole lot of damage, but nevertheless, there, there was a lot was documented. So um, in Phoenix, buildings swayed. In Tucson, houses were cracked and some chimneys fell. In Yuma, water sloshed in canals. In Albuquerque, people felt seasick and rushed out into the streets. My favorite was Charleston. Now, you notice I said Charleston AT. That's because at that time, we still were in a state. We were still Arizona territory. And uh, it was a town that didn't last long after the earthquake, probably because the walls of the saloon did a two-step and the floor did a shimmy. And that's fun, you know, it's fun to laugh at that, but unfortunately for northern Sonora, where the closest to the epicenter of the earthquake, um, it was pretty tragic and one entire town of Bavispe was pretty much wiped out. Now on the right, it's kind of interesting, at the lower right you see a picture, a photograph that was taken not long after the earthquake of the rupture, the fault scarp that resulted from that earthquake. That was essentially a wall about 14 feet high that ran for miles across the countryside that formed at the time of that earthquake. Basically, when that earthquake happened, the area on the right dropped down, the area on the right stayed up high, and on the left stayed up high, and you had this tremendous fault scarp. And today we can look on, on aerial photos or we can go out in the field and we can trace the rupture of that earthquake for 63 miles from Sonora all the way up just about to the border of Arizona. That's a sizable rupture. That's the longest of its type recorded in historic times. So, you know, this happened in 1887, but just imagine if something like that happened again today, what could happen in Arizona? That would be not something we'd want to experience, and it could be very, very serious, not only for northern Mexico, but for southern Arizona as well. And, and not to, to worry anybody, but the fact is that there has been some increased measured seismic activity in that fault zone within the last couple of years. Doesn't mean that anything's gonna happen, but uh, something we wanna keep an eye on. Okay, early part of the 20th century, 1906, 1910, 1912, there were a series of damaging earthquakes in the Flagstaff area. Um, and the documentation you see here in uh, January, 1906, chimneys were shaken down, crockery fell, clocks were stopped, School children were thrown into panic. September 1910, dam building crew working north of the San Francisco peaks uh, uh, felt some, numerous severe shocks. These were again were magnitudes around six, which are which are pretty sizable. An intensity of seven or more. Seven is moderate. The scale goes up to about ten, and so those were those were sizable quakes for their time. And the interesting thing was the uh, uh, follow up quake in August 1912 was the oldest surviving recording. There was a seismograph in Denver of all places that picked up the signal from that earthquake in 1912. So that's the first recorded earthquake in Arizona recorded on a seismograph. Jump ahead to 2005. Some of you may remember this. Just east of Sedona on March 2nd, there was a magnitude 4.6 quake. That was significant enough that people in Sedona, people in Winslow, that area, they felt it. Um, I had a good friend in Sedona she said it pretty much knocked her out of bed. So, you know, it was, it was something to think about. And uh, you can see the, the red boxes showed areas where people called in that they actually felt some of the intensity of the quake, and that includes Phoenix. Again, what determines that is partly where the quake is, partly what the magnitude of the quake is, but also what the geology of your area is like. Is it solid rock? Is it loose material? Is there water in the ground? All these sorts of things influence how you actually feel that earthquake. Some of you may remember the Easter Sunday earthquake of April 4th, 2010. That was a magnitude 7-2 quake just over the border in northern Baja. And uh, while the, the intensity was greatest, this is an intensity map you see here, the intensity was greatest, of course, close to the epicenter in, uh, in southern California, northern Mexico, 
um, a lot of people in Phoenix felt it. Uh, I happen to be out of town. I have a habit of being out of town when earthquakes happen nearby. But uh, people at ASU, people who were in some of their buildings said that they were, particularly if they were on higher floors of the buildings in, uh, in Phoenix or Tempe, they felt the shaking and uh, people's pools bounced. And uh, what you're looking at there is a map, which is, a, it's called a community intensity map. And what that is, is that there's actually a website. It's called, did you feel it? And you can Google, did you feel it? If you ever feel an earthquake, if you ever feel the effects of an earthquake, you're always encouraged to go on that website and report what you felt. And they collect the information. In this case, this was about 77,746 people uh, checked in to tell what they felt. And they were able to compile a pretty accurate intensity map that shows very clearly that, you know, the most, the biggest effect was close to the earthquake, but people felt it in Salt Lake City, people felt it in Albuquerque, people felt it in El Paso, people felt it in San Francisco. That was a pretty good size quake. November 2014, a magnitude 4.7 quake near Kachina Village between Sedona and Flagstaff. And again, not a whole lot of intensity. The intensity was kind of on the light scale, but it was felt across Northern Arizona. Okay, here's one that I bet a lot of you remember. My wife felt this one. Again, I was out of town when this happened. I have this, this just knack for not being here, but there was a 4.1 quake in, in uh, Black Canyon City and it was felt all across Phoenix. So, uh, you know, that was not a big quake, but it was enough that, that millions of people were able to feel the shaking from that quake. So you bet we do have earthquakes in and around Arizona and you bet that it's quite possible that we could have another one in the near future. If you're interested in determining where the most likely places to experience earthquakes would be and other natural hazards like uh, ground, uh, ground fishing and flash floods and even volcanic activity, landsliding, um, there's a wonderful tool that the Arizona Geological Survey produces called the Arizona Geological Survey Natural Hazards Viewer. It's essentially a, uh, it's a, a GIS uh, geographic information system screen that you can you can click on different hazards and they'll come up on the map and this kind of shows all the hazards that are in in Arizona you can be selective you can just pick earthquakes if you want or just pick other ones but uh, it's kind of a long uh, web link but just google azgs natural hazards viewer and and you'll find it so I'm going to finish up again as Rick mentioned I know I think I've gone way over my time uh, but uh, tomorrow is shakeout day and the great shakeout is an event that happens all around the world. It's International Shakeout Day, and it's held to increase earthquake awareness. And what it is, is it's uh, everybody at 1020 on their local time on 1020, so 1020 a.m. tomorrow, um, you're encouraged to do an earthquake drill with your friends, with your coworkers, with your family, and respond to what you would do in case there was an earthquake. So the question is, what do you do if there's an earthquake? I'll show you in just a moment, but I also want to mention that it's not too late to register. You can register on the ShakeOut website and you can be a part of this global community that's practicing earthquake safety. Uh, that last count, I think I see 67,000 people in the state of Arizona have already registered to be a part of ShakeOut tomorrow. And I'm, I'm going to be teaching a class at that time tomorrow, so I'm going to be telling all my students to to respond and, and what do you do? This is what you do. Okay, the first thing to know is that a lot of things that people might think you wanna do during an earthquake, like go hide in the door frame or try to get out of a building, don't do that. Okay, first of all, door frames are not typically not gonna be strong enough to protect you. And they're kind of narrow anyway, there's all kinds of stuff falling around. Trying to get out of a building is a bad idea because typically, unless you're right by the door, you're not gonna get out in time to escape falling materials. So what do you do? It's very simple. Drop, cover, and hold on. What you want to do is you want to try to find something sturdy like a table that you can get under that will give you some shelter from above. And you get under that table and you hold on to the table so that if there's vibration in the ground, the table doesn't vibrate away from you. You duck down, you make yourself into a ball as tight as you can, get under that table and hang on to that table and wait for the earthquake to finish to pass. And that's all there is to it. Try to find something like that. I mean, you could, a table, a, uh, uh, sometimes like a large chair might, might be the only thing you have, but get something that you can hide under close to your vicinity. Don't try to run for it. It's always a bad idea to do that. Drop, cover, and hold on. That's what you do. And that's what hopefully a lot of people are going to do at 10, 20 a.m. tomorrow. 
uh, and not because there's a real earthquake, but because they're practicing. So I'm going to leave you with this. If you'd like to find more information on earthquakes, there are three great websites here. The U.S. Geological Survey has, is, is the agency that's charged with uh, monitoring and, and reporting on earthquakes for the nation. And so they have a very elaborate website on earthquakes. And that's where the Did You Feel It page is, too. Um, IRIS, I use some of their resources. That's a great one, particularly if you're interested in educational resources. And our own Arizona Geological Survey has a great page on earthquakes in Arizona, and it has a link to the Natural Hazards Viewer. So if you want, you can maybe take a screenshot of that, or maybe we'll, we'll have that up later so you can have those resources. Excellent. Yes, Steve, actually, that's what we do. So we will put those, we're going to drop them into the chat, or uh, we'll, we'll try to. And then um, uh, Kim also sends out a little email afterwards, just thanking people from coming and looking for comments. And we usually kind of capture those and sort of like send them in okay. there. So that was really super. Uh, <laughs> there oh, you so, go. So, so that's exactly that's, 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 so there they are. That, that they're doing exactly what you're supposed to do, except they should be holding on to that table. Yeah. So Kim and I were talking about this before the show, and Kim, you're actually from. So this is this is not you. But <laughs> no, it's not me. <laughs> but this is what I used to do when I was in elementary school because we did where, earthquake drills. <laughs> where was that? Where were you living when you had the the earthquake drill things? Um, I lived in the Bay Area, so oh, okay, San Francisco good. Bay Area, so um, in the East Bay in Oakland. So um, we did these probably twice a year, um, along with fire drills. Okay, so, Kim, but, do you yeah. still do them? Do I still do them? <laughs> <laughs> no. Tomorrow at 10 20. Tomorrow at 10 20, I will. Um, and occasionally we do do fire drills, but no. So <laughs> I just thought I'd share this, Steve. <laughs> I love it. I love it. That's, that's a great picture. And Steve, it was a great presentation. And I, I had forgotten because we had we used to do this this like program in the Marston Theater uh, several years ago. We kind of do that thing. And I'd forgotten all the, 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 that history of some of this old kind of stuff that happened in Arizona and northern Mexico. So uh, we, we don't seem to have those big, huge, gigantic quakes now. Is it just because our buildings are better? Or is it that we're just not having those big dramatic earthquakes these days? And so why does that happen back in early history? And maybe we don't have those now. Well, it's 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 just a time question. I mean, we're looking back over, you know, over a couple of centuries and over that much time, you're likely to have something. And so if we look forward the same amount of time, we're probably going to encounter similar rates of, of, of seismic activity. Uh, we don't have the, the, the great hazard or I should say as high a level of hazard as areas that are closer to more active fault boundaries or active faults. As I said, um, California is very seismically active. Nevada is very seismically active. Utah, um, <clears throat> Hawaii, because of the volcanic activity in the Pacific Northwest, um, we're just outside of that. But, but nevertheless, we are, we are in a region where, you know, if, if, let's say there's a magnitude seven and a half or eight quake along the San Andreas Fault, uh, we're going to feel that in large parts of the state. And places like Yuma will probably sustain some some damage, unfortunately. And then, of course, the other thing that people think about is that that, you know, heaven forbid, if there is a if there is a very bad quake in California, and people have to relocate for a while, where are they going to relocate to? Yeah, they're going to come here. Place. Yeah, that's get on I ten, and you find yourself in Arizona. So we may we may the same way that that cities like New Orleans served as a as a refuge after Hurricane Katrina for I mean cities like um, like Houston, Oklahoma and City, and Dallas. Yeah. For New Orleans, we we may have to shoulder that responsibility for Southern California someday. It's all it's always fascinating. We think you know, I we think it might not happen, but of course it could happen. And I I also have childhood recollection. I grew up in Stockton, which is sort of Central California. We had little quakes there, and then I, in Denver, I, surprisingly, Denver also. I don't oh know, yeah, known yeah, for. Colorado is Denver, I, I the just, same thing. I just remember, um, you know, often, I mean, it was like once every couple months, you'd feel a little sort of sway and shake. Mm -hmm. So Super. Uh, I think we have some audience questions. So we're going to ask um, um, Alex if we got something going here. Yes, we do have some audience questions. We have a few. Um, Steve actually asked two questions. They're kind of separate. Um, the first one is, is an oblique fault also known as a thrust fault? No, exactly. So um, a thrust fault, they're, they're, Basically, there are two types of faults. There, there's faults that we call strike slip, which basically is sideways motion, and dip slip faults, which is, has a vertical component to it. And mm -hmm. a, a 
a, a, a we'll fault where where the where we call the hanging wall. So lower side goes up like that. That's called a reverse fault. But if it's at a very shallow angle and does that, that's what we call a thrust fault. Okay. If the if the side goes down instead of up, we call that a normal fault. And if it has a really shallow angle and does that, we call it a detachment fault. And but those are all like pure where all the motion is considered to be in, in, in either all vertical or all sideways. And real faults don't always do that. Real faults, they might have a component where it slips partly down and partly sideways. And that's what an oblique fault is. Oblique okay. fault is one where it kind of goes, the, the net movement is diagonal rather than either straight down or straight across. So. All right. That Perfect. That's, that's a great explanation. Make a good, yeah, it makes a pretty good demonstration, right? With the... <laughs> and then, um, so the the plate that here in Arizona we're located on, uh, what direction is that moving right now? He says he assumes great, west, but not really sure. Great question. Um, the the strikes the fault the San Andreas fault is a strike slip fault, which basically means there's sideways motion. So my hands are horizontal like that. We call it a right lateral, which means that that the North American side is essentially moving to the southwest southeast. I'm sorry, and the Pacific side is moving to the northwest relative to each other. And we call it right lateral because no matter which side of the fault you're standing on, if you look across the fault to the other side, the other side appears to be moving to the right. Okay, and that's, that doesn't matter. If you're on the California side, Arizona looks to be moving to the right. If you're, or I should say, if you're on the Pacific side, North America looks to be moving to the right. If you're on the North America side, the Pacific looks to be moving to the right. You can, you can draw it, you can draw a line with arrows going in opposite directions and you can see that. So it's, it's called a right lateral strike slip fault. And so, All yeah, right. so what, what the, the North American plate is essentially, but it's not moving very much. I mean, the fact is that it's the Pacific plate, you know, the net move, then most of the movement is to the Northwest, but the movement on the Pacific side is a little bit greater. And that's why the, the difference between them is right lateral. All right, perfect. And then we have one last question from Marcella who asks, how do you know the seismates were caused by an earthquake besides the sediment being wavy? Yeah, well, that, that's a good question. There are some people who would attribute that to another phenomenon, which is called soft sediment deformation. And soft sediment deformation is just essentially, the, the sediment would not be deposited so much in a wavy way. You might, you might see some ripples if it was deposited by a current, like a stream or a, a wave moving forward you wouldn't expect to see those sort of profound ripples through the entire sediment unless either it was a seismite or it was soft sediment deformation. And soft sediment deformation essentially is when the sediment itself is just kind of sagging of its own weight while it's still wet. And I am not an expert on interpreting those patterns in sedimentary rocks, but people who are whom I trust have most of them, I would say, lean toward them being seismites. And seismites can be found in other places as well. And we have seen recent seismites. We've actually seen them in sediments that are still wet that haven't turned into rock yet. And these resemble what we see there. So, so there is a possibility that they were caused by something else. There's always that possibility. But, but the, the most widely held interpretation for those particular rocks is that those were earthquakes. Excellent. And it did turn out that that was geologically a pretty active time in Arizona history. So it's not unreasonable that there would have been quakes. All right. Well, perfect. You're an amazing wealth of knowledge. You, you speak like an encyclopedia. I mean, this is because I'm really old. I've been around. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think it's excellent. And, and I just, I always, I love having you sort of like just come on the show because really I, uh, you know, part of the idea of the show is things that you can go out and look at and you can go out and look at Arizona geology. I mean, it is amazing. You sure can travel anywhere up, you know, up north to the canyon or down south in, in the regions. Arizona geology is fascinating. And there's a, there's a whole bunch going on here. So, and now we know. And so uh, for everybody, just, you know, tomorrow is the day. So earthquake awareness, yes. and uh, we all need to be aware of it. And so, uh, so, so we've done our duty, Steve. We've done it. We've and, and don't forget for the Spanish speakers, it's agachase, cubrase, agarrase. Yeah. And then my, my, I, just, I can't roll my R's as well as I should, but. Uh, and then something I, I, as it, through your discussion, something I wanted to sort of suggest to you is maybe you could share your travel schedule with us. And so we know when we're more yeah. likely to have an earthquake. Is that, yeah, is that yeah, right? Yeah. Okay. I think that would be good. Well, I, I could, I could rattle off at least 10, 10 examples of 
places that have been hit by quakes where I should have been and wasn't. <laughs> okay. It's really, it's really uncanny. Or just follow you around and we wouldn't have a problem. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, Steve. Thank you very much for being a guest on the show. Thanks for having me, Rick. And thanks, it's everybody. And, and enjoy the rest of the show. And okay. remember tomorrow to, to do that drill. Good. Hey, thank you. Uh, and thank you again. And so, so for the audience, uh, we've sort of, we, that we ran a little longer than we thought, but it was fascinating. I just love uh, seeing that's an amazing PowerPoint show, uh, kind of show us a little bit about the history. And I just, I learned something new every time I see one of those and just uh, and talk. Uh, I do want to just kind of, uh, I, I think what I'm going to do is sort of like make a, a, an executive uh, pro programming decision. And uh, I do want to show you some night sky things. And, but I think I'm going to save a discussion about Saturn and how to look at Saturn for a two weeks from now. It will still be there. It'll be great. And so we'll sort of save that part. But if you uh, if you like, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show uh, share with you uh, uh, my screen, <clears throat> which is my planetarium program. Uh, for those of that watch the show, you know, many, many times, this is my go to I'm doing this on my little iPad. Uh, that's it. We sort of have just have it wired in. So it becomes part of what you can see. And this particular program that I use here is called Sky Safari Pro. And uh, it's actually, uh, anybody can buy it, you can do it. It's, and there are others, there's lots of different uh, uh, kinds of planetarium programs for different kinds of computers if you want. And so I kind of like this. Maybe what you haven't seen before is I've just kind of started by leaving all the little stick lines that sort of make up our constellations and the names of the constellations on the screen before we start. And then I'm just gonna tell everybody just as a little way of orientation, this is actually set up for tonight, right, right after the show. So in what is it now in 15, 20 minutes, uh, and from our location, this, these, this is what our sky is going to look like, at least uh, hypothetically, right, or uh, theoretically, uh, not with our light pollution. And I think it's a little cloudy again tonight. And so uh, everything that is in green is below a horizon. Everything that's in within that middle circle is above the horizon. And what I want to do is I want to call our attention to the south southeast. And I wanted to just kind of show you here. I'm just going to kind of draw. I'm going to sketch with my um, my pen here a little bit. Um, um, there are a number of constellations down here that are associated with water. And you might not have heard of some of these. This is called Pisces Austrinus, which literally just means southern fish uh, or southern fishes. Uh, a couple of constellations uh, from the from our zodiac. Here's Capricornus right here, uh, the sea goat. Here is Aquarius, the water bearer. Uh, here is the Pisces that you might know, or some of you might be have Pisces as your sign. It sort of like uh, comes around this way. And this right here is a is a sea monster. Sometimes it's called a whale. Sometimes it's called a kraken. Sometimes it's uh, uh, <clears throat> just a gnarly monster when you see it in star charts. It's got big teeth and bad breath and everything else going for it. And so. So this is essentially part of a huge region of the sky. It's taking over the entire east, south, southeast of the night sky, just above the horizon. And so uh, people that write about this stuff and people that research this stuff and people know the history of some of these constellations and how they were developed um, it has kind of suggested that this isn't just accidental. Uh, this is kind of the part of the sky that is the sea. Um, well, let me see if I can pull up. I don't know if I can do it. Uh, now, I'm going to pull up a little map, see if I can put it on the screen. I think you guys can see that, right? <clears throat> Um, so this is essentially a map of the Mideast, and most of the constellations, actually all of the constellations I just described to you, come from pre-Greek Eastern Mediterranean cultures. They're all the way back to Assyrians and mostly Babylonians. Uh, this is where we sort of have our first reference of these constellations and where we start to see them in development. That particular region is now sort of between Iraq and Iran, and that's the center part of your screen, sort of the purplish dark outline is Iraq, the other one is Iran. In this particular map, it's old enough to call Iran Persia, and so this is sort of the, the part these people had an orientation not only to a night sky that is land-based, but in their world, they also were very aware of the great southern sea. And so south of this particular region in, um, in, in this particular thing, while these constellations, while sort of their awareness about cosmos and everything else was being uh, uh, associated, uh, basically to the south, 
was the C. And so that combined with another thing here, I'm going to just going to show you something else. Um, uh, I'm going to add the, um, uh, let me see, I'm going to add, where is it? Sort of uh, grids and reference. <clears throat> Ecliptic path to the screen. Sorry, I'm doing a menu. So this yellow line now that you see going across the screen is the what we call the line of the ecliptic, and it's the path of the sun through the sky. So not only do there are these people aware of the sky and they know these constellations and they're developing these constellations and they know the seasonality, but they also are also aware that south of them is this great southern sea. And this particular time of year, right, when this line is sort of like moving across the, the sun, is moving across the sky, uh, for them, when the sun was moving through uh, Capricornus and, and Sagittarius, it was at its lowest point in the sky. So it would almost look like to them that the sun was getting closer to or the sun was dipping into where the sun was favoring the southern ocean during its travel. And so this is really the speculation. And, and, and I get this because I like to read this kind of stuff. I like to read some books. We're going to drop into the chat. I've got a couple of books I wanted to reference for you. One is one of my favorite authors is a guy named Chet Ramo. And he wrote a book uh, that's very famous, easy to use, called 365 uh, uh, Starry Nights. And uh, that's kind of one I kind of refer to every once in a while. He also wrote a book called The Soul of the Night. And that's one I absolutely recommend everybody read. Uh, and that's kind of cool. And then the other one, I sort of got some of this information from The Stargazer's Guide by an Emily uh, Winterburn. And so, but there, there are more and there are many. And so if you're interested in some of this stuff about ancient cultures and what they were able to see in the night sky. I wanted to also show you before I leave, I've just got two stars I wanted to point out um, to kind of just make you aware. And one of them is in Pisces Austrinus. Remember, that's the, the southern fish. I'll just sort of like uh, draw a little line to it right now. This particular star has a name. It's called Fomohat. And uh, for, I think I can spell this right, Fomohat, H-A-U-T. And it, it, it really is the eye of the southern fish. And so uh, in, 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 in ancient days, you would do your agriculture. We've talked about this a lot, sort of during the summertime. And as everything starts to wane, as we start to become uh, in the uh, uh, sort of this moving the transition between summer and fall and all that stuff, attention would be about getting your crops in and doing that stuff. But then you would actually sort of go into the endeavor of animal gathering and fishing and those kinds of things. So there's a relationship between that too. And so the Southern fish makes sense there. But Fomohat also has this other property and a very, very modern science thing. Uh, I'm gonna just sort of like put a little sort of thing on the screen. This is a, uh, a, a recent, a very sophisticated telescope view of the star Fomohat. And it's in the middle of this thing. Uh, what you're seeing here is sort of looks like an eye, but that's not the intent here. That's not what it is. But Fomohat, the star, is an ancient star and it's becoming a white dwarf. And what we've been able to do with this is see this in infrared. We can see a very, very, very hot early solar system, something that sort of like is, uh, is kind of still cooling. And embedded in there, you can see this little inset is sort of the path of a planet. And this was all discovered for the first time in 2008. So that's not that long ago. We have researchers at ASU that sort of look at this too. And so it's really one of the first, uh, it's not the first system of stars uh, like solar systems around another star ever discovered, but it's really one of the first ones understood and one of the first ones that we've actually been able to image and see planets. And so embedded in all that dust and debris and all that stuff in the middle there, uh, our planet. So it has become a very, very important star in research and all of that. So um, then this one over here, it's one of my sort of favorite stars to point out when we're in star shows. It's called um, uh, Al Getty. And uh, Al Getty is sort of a, a modern sort of word from Al Gate, and that is Arabic for uh, uh, goat. <clears throat> and so you probably know Capricornus as a goat constellation, but most people might also know that it is actually a sea goat. 
And the story behind that one is, here's the constellation in ancient charts, is that um, this, the, the, uh, the goat represents Pan. Remember, Pan was a human, and on land, he had a goat legs, a goat bottom, and a man, sort of uh, 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 his torso and everything above the waist was man. Um, there is a story about Typhoon, which was a sort of a, a really, really big monstrous thing. Typhoon sort of it gets its name from sea storms and things like that. Uh, come from that. And uh, there's a story where Pan was running from Typhoon and jumped into a river and everything transformed. Below the waist became the body of a fish and above the waist became the body of a goat. <clears throat> And uh, after that, uh, Zeus, the gods, put him and moved him up into the sky as a prominent location. So if that's your sign and you're a Capricorn, uh, that's kind of what's going on there. And so, but uh, just sort of knowing that, that in this particular place, the sun is moving in the direction from right to left on the screen, following the yellow line. As it makes that transition through Capricorn, we also transition from uh, sort of land-based ideas and animals and into uh, sort of the sea-based system, as you know. So uh, the um, other thing I just wanted to say about Al Getty is it's actually a double star, and you can see it. So it's a it's very very it's a not very bright, so very difficult to see from the city lights. But if you get out into the country, easily noticeable. If you know this part of the sky, you can find Al Getty. It's the Alpha Star of uh, Capricornus, but it's also a double. And it's actually what we call an optical double. So it is not two stars interacting with each other, but it is actually two stars that are sitting right next to each other. Here's a way, the one on the right is called uh, Al Getty Prima, and the one on the left is called Al Getty Secunda. And uh, so they're both them together make up this particular star in Capricorn. What's really kind of cool about that is that the brighter one, the one on the left is only about a hundred light years away only, right? That's a long ways away. The one on the right is about six, almost uh, 700, a little less than 700 light years away. So there's a tremendous distance between those two stars, but we just see them from our point of view as almost right together. And sometimes when I'm doing star shows at night and I'm sort of like talking to people about this and I show them that star, I can point out Al Getty at that part of the system and then another star way, way across the sky, completely across and over the top. And I can sort of like just tell them that the two stars that appear further apart over on this side of the sky and over on that side of the sky are actually closer together than these two little optical double stars that are in the sky. So that's what we have time for tonight. <clears throat> I wanted to just kind of like point this out because these are not big, bright constellations. They're not ones we talk about very often, but there's a, a part of the sky here that is sort of, is it, it, it relates to water, it relates to the Southern Ocean, it relates to sort of things waterborne. We didn't talk much about Aquarius, but it also is water bearer, you know that. And in ancient times, and especially in Egypt and uh, those areas, uh, he was, uh, to, he was the, the person that delivered water into the rivers. So as the Nile River is running by, uh, there is a constellation in the southern part, as you look to the south from them, where that water is delivered from. And Aquarius is the water bearer, the one sort of pouring the water into the liver, river and delivering it to you. Okay, so there's some, uh, uh, some stuff. I'm going to kind of stop there with this, and uh, I'm going to actually ask the team to come back with some quick polls and some questions, and then we'll move on to the next part. Thank you, everybody. Everybody. Okay. Yes, yeah, so we don't have many questions, but we will launch our polls. So, of the 12 signs associated with the zodiac, how many are associated with water? Your choices are 3, 7, 10, and 12. And I just while we wait for those answers to come in, we don't really have any questions since the last break, unless there's anything that you want to touch upon more, Rick. No, that's all right. Uh, Rick, do we 
want to have Meg come on and do yeah, I, th I think I think that's an excellent idea. Um, so uh, actually, just really quickly, uh, I'd like to go ahead and close the poll. And I'd like to have Armin, just if you don't mind, Armin, we'll sort of we've gone long on our show. But if you'd tell everybody sort of like what to watch for in the um, um, in the uh, meteor shower, and then we'll go to Meg right after that. So we've got about two minutes each, and then we'll close. Yes, of course. So if you're going to be looking to the night sky in the southeast direction, if you're in the northern hemisphere, you might notice a pretty famous meteor shower happening right now, actually. Uh, let me share my screen and let's talk about how to view the Orionids. So the Orionids, uh, they're one of the most uh, beautiful meteor showers of the year, and they're actually occurring right now, today, tomorrow, in the next coming days. And one of the best ways you can view them is to go as far away as you can from the city, find a nice dark open sky, face southeast if you're in the northern hemisphere or northeast if you're in the southern hemisphere. Um, don't look directly towards the constellation of Orion. That's where these um, meteor showers are gonna be coming from. Look about 45 degrees away from it in the southeastern direction and you'll be able to see uh, a really amazing show if you let your uh, eyes adjust about 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, let it adjust to the dark, make sure there's no light around you, turn off your phones and yeah, uh, enjoy the show. Find dark open sky and enjoy the amazing meteor show. So I'm going to do it and uh, I'll be out there tonight to sort of, uh, I just noticed just before the show I was outside and I noticed some thin clouds kind of coming over. I hope those break up and yeah. move out of there. But, uh, and I'm not going to travel away from the city. I'm just going to go in my backyard and I'm going to be patient and I'm going to look up at about, about 1.30 or 2 in the morning and see if I can see anything. <laughs> And uh, we closed the poll very quickly, but the right answer was three. Yeah, so there's three signs of the zodiac all in order. I'm going to include the sea goat, right? Uh, Capricornus, uh, Aquarius, and Pisces, and all of those are sort of part of that region of the sky that's associated with water and oceans and that uh, kind of thing. So, uh, so that's it. And Meg, what did we do last weekend? What's going on? What was that all about? Rick, maybe the better answer is what didn't we do last weekend? <laughs> okay. Let me share my screen. Thank you. Okay, everybody, for those of you that have been, um, I want to start this, I'm going to get this show going. Uh, if you have not visited our ISTB4 building, this is it on Saturday, and it was quite a time. Uh, in our gallery of scientific exploration, this is a view looking down from second to first floor at the start of the event. And uh, as the day proceeded, we welcomed many, many guests, and we certainly look forward to welcoming you all soon, sometime, some way, somehow. Uh, you see our beautiful magic planet. Uh, there's lots of exploration going on, low frequency cosmology, Psyche model, Center for Education through Exploration. I'm uh, trying to go to the next slide. Uh, our friends from the Mass Cam Z team were there talking about the amazing Perseverance rover, which continues to do great science on the surface of Mars. There's Kim, if you didn't see her. I saw Another them. view from down below. Can you see the Tycho rover over here? This is the next generation lunar rover uh, for view. And this is part of the full scale model of the Psyche spacecraft. We really look forward to when you can visit us to see that. And of course, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that we welcome guests into the Marston Theater. Of course, we love our virtual Mar Marston Night Sky uh, audience, and we're so glad that you join us every other week. But we do look forward to having you back in sight and in the seats so that we can welcome you in the proper way. Uh, we had our friends from the Hubble Space Telescope and James Webb Space Telescope, part of Roger Winhorst's uh, exploration group, showing us great images. There's uh, Zen Holmes with the group uh, Exploring Organic Processes in Geochemistry, or Geopig, showing us wonderful weird water. So we had a, a combination there of uh, Zen and um, uh, Dr. Water and Geopig. Uh, we, did we make an impact, everybody? You bet we did, because Dr. Impact was there, and there were people, uh, uh, this is one of our ASU NASA Space Grant interns, talking about impact, and there were many, many people that learned about impacts, and we made a great impact uh, all day long. Now, on the second floor, 
This was one of two days when our friends at the Busex Center for Meteorite Studies would uh, look at the rock that you brought in to tell you whether it was a meteorite or a meteor wrong. And there's Zainab and Melinda. There's Dr. Lawrence Garvey. You may remember him from Asteroid Day when we were in the gallery. And we welcomed many, many guests up to the uh, uh, gallery. Now, our friends at the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter Facility, there were two facilities. Here's Tom Tabersi at LROC welcoming guests. Here's Ezra Cisneros. They made us very welcome. Uh, there was some rain that day, everybody. I want you to find the face in the crowd. There are actually a couple of familiar faces. That's Kim right there. She's talking to Philip Christensen. Here, this guy, look at, he's telling people where to go in the nice way. And all of these uh, people here are looking up at the Psyche model. I really hope you'll come and visit. And I just have to close with this. This is Dr. Danny Jacobs and our own Rick Alling showing us, it was a very good day, everyone. And with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And I wanna thank our team for an incredible, incredible day. Uh, and we look forward to welcoming you in person. I'm gonna turn it over to Kim Baptista who has some images for us uh, with a shout out to our own Charlotte Thomas. Kim, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Thanks so much. Yes, and this is uh, the Martin family. They did not let the raindrops keep them away. Sure. You know, if I can advance my screen here. That's what I would do if I was a kid. That's yeah. What and they came and they they explored and saw all the cool things that we're doing here. And we thank the Martin family for sharing these photos with us. And I invite you to join us on November 2nd for our next virtual night sky. And then November 4th, if you feel like you missed out on EC day, come on down because we're going to do it again for open house with the grad students on November 4th from 630 to 9. And then... We invite you to come back on November 19th for the homecoming block party. Time to be determined once they announce it for the football game, but we will be there with our friends over at Knowledge Enterprise, um, sharing all the great things that we're doing, but over near Old Main. And with that, I'm gonna hand it back to Rick and I would encourage everybody to come on down and visit us. I'm just gonna mostly wrap it up. It makes me tired to see all that. And I also wanted to point out that open house on November 4th is actually an evening event. And it really is one of the, we do that twice a year and we deploy telescopes. So uh, there's a way not only to come down and see some programs and see some things inside the building, but also at night, we have some telescopes outside and you can uh, use those to look at phenomenon in the night sky. And so that'll be kind of fun. So anyway, well, thank you very much. Rick, our, our keynote speaker will be Professor Roger Windhorst to talk about the James Webb Space oh, Telescope. Excellent. Don't forget, we want to see everybody. I didn't know that. That's actually excellent. So the James Webb updates and uh, and and Roger Windhorst is the best to have. That's really super cool. Good to know. And so anyway, we've gone long. I'm going to see everybody in two weeks. Uh, just keep an eye on what we're doing, and uh, just so so appreciate your uh, your joining us every every couple of weeks. And uh, we'll see you later. Thank you very much.